Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Talmadge with Love of Christ Lutheran Church in Mesa, Arizona. Pastor Nanette Christofferson and I are seeking to provide brief introductions to a couple of the Bible readings assigned for upcoming Sundays. Today, I'd like to have us take a look at the Old Testament reading from Ezekiel 34, verses 11 to 24, which are assigned for Sunday, November 23rd, Christ the King Sunday in the lectionary. As we look at some of these Old Testament readings, it's helpful to always get a background or a little bit of idea of who these uh, individuals are that these books are named after. So who is Ezekiel? Uh, it appears that Ezekiel was the son of an Israelite priest. He began his prophetic ministry in 593 before the Common Era remembering that the fall of Jerusalem under Babylon happened in 586 before the Common Era. So about seven years before the fall of Babylon or Jerusalem, uh, Ezekiel was called into the ministry of being a prophet. And it's believed that his ministry continued through 571 before Common Era. He's seen as a contemporary of Jeremiah, and he is considered one of the major prophets of the Old Testament, due to the length of time that his ministry lasted. What's the story? The political backstory for the book begins after the first time Jerusalem submitted to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in 597 before Common Era. Many of Israel's political and religious leaders, including a young king in the line of David, Jehoiakim, were deported and exiled to Babylon. Ezekiel was likely among that group. Jehoiakim's uncle Zedekiah was set up as a puppet king over Israel. Midway through the book of Ezekiel, and right before our reading, uh, our, our section of, this, of the book uh, assigned to this Sunday, in Ezekiel 33:21, we read that Jerusalem falls to the Babylonians and Zedekiah is captured while attempting to escape. After seeing his sons and officials slaughtered, Zedekiah is blinded, taken to Babylon, and not heard from again. The concluding chapters of the book are set after Jerusalem and Solomon's grand temple are reduced to rubble. There are four primary sections in the book of Ezekiel. Judgments against Jerusalem and Israel are recorded in chapters 1 through 24, Judgments against foreign nations are found in chapters 25 through 32. Promises of restoration are found in chapters 33 to 39, which is uh, where our reading is found. And then a vision of a reestablishment temple and order in Jerusalem and Israel, chapters 40 to 48. What's the message? Ezekiel boldly confronts Israel's unfaithfulness and idolatry and emphasizes the absolute holiness of the Lord. Set in the hopelessness of exile, the book is a swirl of scolding judgments, mind-blowing visions, and hopeful promises, of which have inspired the creative imagination of Christian writers through the centuries, including those who have written a number of African-American spirituals. The book addresses difficult questions, questions about why God would allow God's people to be removed from Jerusalem and the temple destroyed. How could God go back on the promises of giving Israel the land and establishing the temple in Jerusalem as God's dwelling place? If the Lord is the God of Israel, how could God allow the prolonged crisis of the exile? To happen. A key theme in the book of Ezekiel. In spite of Israel's consistent idolatrous rebellion, the Lord acts to preserve the holiness of the Lord's name. The exile is the Lord's just judgment of Israel's unholiness. A word of hope is lifted up. Lifted up after holding those in positions of power, influence, and leadership as responsible in these words prior to our reading. The Lord does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked, as, Jer as Ezekiel 33 verse 11 says. 
against any attempt to tame God, the book of Ezekiel is a testimony that God is holy beyond understanding and control. The context of our lesson for Sunday. Jerusalem has followed, has fallen. Uh, Jeremiah, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 33 verse 21 declares that the city has been destroyed. And the question is, why? And Ezekiel answers that. Because of all their abominations they have committed in verse 29 of chapter 33. And then in 33 we hear, the Lord lets Ezekiel and the other prophets know that they have an uphill road to travel as the people, they hear what you say, but they will not do it. I maybe know a few pastors who might feel like that at times. They hear what you say, but they will not do it. Then leading into our lesson, we're in chapter 34, verses 1 to 10. We get a word against the shepherds. And those are the people entrusted to protect and lead the people of Israel. In verse 2, we have they've been feeding themselves rather than the sheep. Verse 3, they are eating the fat, clothing themselves in fine wool, but do not feed the sheep. Verse 4, they have not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, bound up the injured, brought back the strayed, sought the lost, but use force and harshness on the flock. These are kind of bad shepherds, aren't they? Some questions. What might these few verses say about the use of power, influence, and leadership as it reflects God's ultimate concern over and against self-interest? What co connections do you see to the 21st century realities we face, we know, in these words in 34, 1 through 10? Verses 5 and 6 in chapter 34, the flock has been scattered and dispersed with no one to search for them or seek for them. And then in verse 10, we get God's judgment. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths, so that they may not be food for them. Now our lesson, 34, 11 to 24. God, the true shepherd. Verse 11, God reaffirms, I myself, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. Verses 11 to 15 express the frustration that God is fed up. The Lord steps in where human leaders have failed to carry out the basic responsibilities entrusted to them, feeding and caring for the sheep. So we hear God will seek, God will rescue, God will feed them after gathering them from all the ends of the earth. God will provide good pasture. Verse 15, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down. Verse 16, I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Pastor and author Tim Keller writes, the Hebrew word for justice, mishpat, occurs in its various forms more than 200 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. Its most basic meaning is to treat people equitably. It means acquitting or punishing every person on the merits of the case, regardless of race or social status. Anyone who does the same wrong should be given the same penalty. But mishpat means more than just the punishment of wrongdoing. It also means giving people their rights. 
Deuteronomy 18 directs that the priests of the tabernacle shall be supported by a certain percentage of people's income. This support is described as the priest's mishpat, which means their due or their right. Mishpat then is giving people what they are due, whether punishment or protection and care. This is why if you look at every place the word is used in the Old Testament, several classes of persons continually come up. Over and over again, Mishpat describes taking up the care and cause of widows, orphans, immigrants, and the poor. Those who have been called the quartet of the vulnerable. In pre-modern agrarian societies, these four groups had no social power. They lived at subsistence level and were only days from starvation. If there was any famine, invasion, or even minor social unrest. Today, this quartet would be expanded to include the refugee, the migrant worker, the homeless, and many single parents and elderly people. The mishpat or justness of a society according to the Bible is evaluated by how it treats these groups. Any neglect shown to the needs of the members of this quartet is not merely a lack of mercy or charity, but a violation of justice, of mishpat. God loves and defends those with the least economic and social power, and so should we. That is what it means to do justice. Verses 17 to 19 addresses the difference between rams and goats who appear to bully the weaker in the flock. They trod down the good grass and they stuff their faces and then walk in to drink the water and pollute the drinking water with their feet. Some questions. What might this little section say about how we view stewardship, care of creation, and economic policies as they discount social responsibility and the common good as it applies to those who benefit the most from investment or extraction of resources. Verses 20 to 22. God addresses those who have no sense of responsibility to the whole and think only of getting what they can for themselves. I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. I will save my flock and they shall no longer be ravaged. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. Verses 23 to 24. The Lord will establish a member of David's line to serve as a prince over God's flock. But the Lord will remain as the true king, true shepherd. From our position 2,600 years after these words were spoken, we can see many links to the mission and ministry of Jesus. Jesus comes in the line of David. His mission and ministry heavily emphasize caring for the vulnerable and the marginalized. In the Gospel of John, he calls himself the Good Shepherd in John 10. Our lesson may have direct application to the responsibility of leaders in both the political and religious arena. Justice is not primarily getting even, getting retribution, or getting what we think we deserve. It carries an enormous communal application with an ideal of eliminating the need of winners and losers, victim and victimizers. The goal is that all the sheep are protected, have adequate food and drink, and they trust that those responsible for their oversight, care, and protection are in it for the whole flock and not just for themselves. I end with a question. When you think of a blessed nation, community, or household, what comes to mind? How might this reading from Ezekiel serve as a reminder to the qualities and responsibilities of being blessed by the Lord. Have a great week. God bless you.